For this talk, we introduce the notion of a group and describe its basic properties. In mathematics, a common theme is to exploit symmetry to simplify problems. A formal way of describing symmetry is by using groups. Now, definition, I have a set G, we'll have a binary operation on G back into itself. We'll call that a multiplication. G is called a group if it satisfies the following four properties. First, if we take any two elements in G, we multiply, we get another element in G. Now, this is implied by having a binary operation on G, but if we were working in a larger set, we would need to verify this. Next, we have associativity. So this tells us how we can multiply three elements. So what this says, if we multiply the first two elements and then the third, we get the same answer as if we multiplied the last two elements in the first, as long as we go in the same order. Now, what this says in practice, we don't need to use parentheses. Then, we'll have an identity element. This is going to be an element E in the group. If we take any X in the group, X times E equals E times X is equal to X. So if we multiply by E on either side, it has no effect. Finally, we have inverses for elements. If I take any X in the group, we'll have another element X inverse, such that X times X inverse equals X inverse times X is the identity element. So no matter what element I'm at, say X, I can always multiply by another element to get to the identity. We'll say more about symmetries later when we talk about group actions. For here, we'll jump in with the symmetries of an equilateral triangle. Now, we'll label the vertices of our triangle, one, two, and three. Our group is gonna be the set of symmetries of this triangle. Now, any symmetry of this triangle is gonna induce a bijection from one, two, three to itself. And if we have any bijection from one, two, three to itself, we're going to get a symmetry of the triangle. So for the multiplication, we're just going to do composition of the corresponding bijections. Now, our group has six elements. Okay, to see this, note, if I have a symmetry, there are three places it can send one. Once we've made that choice, there are two ways to arrange the remaining two numbers. So three times two is six elements. If we list these elements, okay, first we have the identity element. That just sends one, two, three to one, two, three respectively. So the corresponding symmetry of the triangle is to do nothing. Then I'm going to write the remaining elements in cycle notation. So this just says we go from left to right. When I get to the end, I come back to the front. Here we have one goes to two. 2 goes to 1, and because 3 is not listed, we send 3 to itself. So 3 is fixed, and we switch 1 and 2. So that's going to be a reflection. We'll have three reflections. Then the remaining elements are going to be rotations. So 1 goes to 2, 2 goes to 3, 3 goes to 1. So 1 goes to 2, 2 goes to 3, 3 goes to 1. It's going to be rotation clockwise by 2 pi thirds. 1, 3, 2. Rotation counterclockwise by 2 pi thirds. Now, okay, so those are our group elements. To show we have a group, we have to go through the following four properties. For here, we're just going to focus on the inverse. Now, note for okay, our reflections, if I do a reflection twice, I'm back in the identity position. So if I take 1, 2 times 1, 2, I get the identity. That means 1, 2 is its own inverse. Okay, same for the other reflections. For 1, 2, 3, well, if I rotate clockwise by 2 pi thirds, how do I get back to the identity position? I rotate in the other direction by 2 pi thirds. So these three cycles are going to be inverse to one another. One last interesting property. If we take any of these elements, 
Okay, we fix one and keep multiplying it by itself. We eventually get to the identity. So the smallest number of those multiplications, okay, that number, we're gonna call the order of the element. So if I do a reflection twice, we get to the identity. So they're gonna be order two. For the rotations, we need three of those to get back to the identity. So we say order three. For some familiar examples of groups, consider the integers, the reals, and the rationals with addition, then the identity element is zero, the inverse of the element x is minus x. If we instead consider multiplication, we have the two element group, plus minus one, I have r star, so it's just the real numbers without zero, and we have q star. Here the identity element is equal to one, the inverse of the element x is 1 over x. So I'll leave it to you to verify the other properties. For an example, it's probably not so familiar. We have modular integers. So I'll fix positive integer n greater than 1. Our group is going to be the set of labels 0, 1, up through n minus 1. Our multiplication is going to be addition, but we add as if we're on a clock. So we add or subtract these numbers, as usual, but then we add or subtract multiples of n until we wind up back in this set of labels. So if I let n be equal to 12, this is just clockwork addition. For an example, okay, let's take z mod 10. We have our addition. So the labels are going to go from 0 to 9. If we take 7 plus 5, I get 12 adding or subtracting multiples of 10 to get in our set of labels, subtract 10 to get a 2. If I take 3 minus 9, so we should think of this as 3 plus 9 inverse or minus 9, we're going to get a minus 6, adding subtracting multiples of 10 to get back in the set of labels, I'm going to add a 10, so it's going to give me a 4. I'll say more about this example in a later talk. Now for things that wouldn't be a group, we could take the natural numbers under addition. So in this case, we're not closed under inversion. So two is in the natural numbers. The additive inverse would be minus two. So that fails. If we take the natural numbers with multiplication, again, not closed under inversion. Two is in the natural numbers, but one half is not. So again, that fails. Now, special property for every group that's on this board. I'll call a group abelian or commutative, okay, another way to say that, if x times y equals y times x for all x and y in the group. So this just says it doesn't matter what order we multiply things in, we can shuffle things around. We've already seen an example that's not abelian, the symmetries of the equilateral triangle. So we'll take two elements, 1, 2, and 2, 3, multiply in either order, show that the products are not equal. Now, we're composing bijections here. So one thing to note, when I compose functions, we're gonna go from right to left. Let's work this out using the cycle notation. So this says, one goes to two, two goes to three, so one goes to three. Here, three goes to three, three goes to two, so three goes to two. Then two goes to one, one goes to one, so two goes to one. So we get the three cycle, one, three, two. If we multiply in the other order, we get the three cycle, one, two, three, and these are not equal. So S3 is non-abelian. Now, S3 is a special case of a general construction. So this is one way to generate a giant class of groups. I'm gonna let X be any set, we're gonna let our group be the set of bijections from x to itself. Multiplication is gonna be composition of functions. See the four properties to get a group. For closure, composition of two bijections is another bijection. Associativity, I'm just gonna follow from associativity for functions. For the identity element, you take the bijection that carries each element to itself. Okay, so the important part here is the identity element is actually going to be a bijection. Finally, 
for inverses, if I have a bijection f, then its inverse is gonna be the inverse function f inverse. Okay, we define that as follows. Okay, and this works because we're working with bijections. Now, if x is equal to, okay, the set one through n, it's gonna be the special case that we call the symmetric group on n letters. And we denote it by s sub n. Now, one thing to note here, okay, if we have a bijection, what we're really doing is taking our space x, okay, each point has a label on it, and we're just rearranging all the labels. So that was what was happening with S3. I was taking all the labels on this triangle and just shuffling them around. Now, we count the number of elements in each S sub n. If F is a bijection from one through n to itself, there are n choices for where I can send one. Once I've made that choice, there are n minus one choices for where we can send two. Then that leaves n minus two choices for where we can send three and so on. So if we multiply through, that gives us n factorial elements for S sub n. To check, if we let n be equal to three, I have three factorial, which is equal to six, which agrees with our result for S3. Now, if we look at S4, okay, so if I use four factorial, I get 24 for the number of elements. If I wanna visualize this, S4 is just gonna be the symmetries of a regular tetrahedron. So we can label our vertices as follows, then each of these bijections is gonna give us, okay, a symmetry of the tetrahedron possibly with reflections. Now, type of elements that can show up here, if we put them in cycle notation, okay, we'll have elements of order four like this, so you should verify that. We have elements of order three like this, elements of order two. Then we have these elements of order two that are gonna be the product of disjoint two cycles. So disjoint because they don't share common numbers. Then finally, we have the identity element. Now note, S4 is still gonna be non abelian. Okay, I could still use one, two times two, three to test. In fact, for any S sub n with n greater than or equal to three, still non abelian since we'll have these elements too. As a final note, groups have a cancellation law. So we use cancellation laws all the time in algebra as if they were second nature. So what this says, if we have x times y equal to x times z, then we can remove the x's and we get y equals z. We have a similar statement if we put the x on the other side. Now to see this, take our equation and I'll multiply both sides on the left by x inverse. So the idea is that the x inverse is gonna cancel with the x's. Now, by associativity, we would group x inverse with x and that product becomes the identity. So we're gonna have the identity times y, and that gives us a y, and likewise for z. So y is equal to z, which is what we were looking for. Now, one way to apply the cancellation law, I can show that the identity element is unique, and that each x inverse is unique. So suppose we have two identity elements, e1 and e2, then, x times e1 is equal to x, x times e2 is equal to x, and we know these are both equal to x, so these are equal, and we can apply the cancellation law to remove the x's on the left-hand side. That gives us e1 equals e2, so our identity element is unique. For the inverses, let's fix an x, and suppose we have inverses x1 inverse and x2 inverse. Same idea. I'm going to multiply x1 inverse times x and get the identity. x2 inverse times x gives me the identity. So we have that these two expressions are equal. And then I can cancel the x's on the right. So I have x1 inverse equals x2 inverse. So the inverse of x is unique.